have to gather openly like this and open up the Bible, sing songs to Christ, and hear teaching from the Word of God. We're thankful even more for the spiritual freedom we have to do this, Father, and for how, through your work in Christ, um, you have made it possible for us to draw near to you and to have a relationship with you and to be those who have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And we ask, O oh God, that this same Spirit would draw each of us to uh, fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus in a life-giving, joy-giving way tonight. And we pray that you will feed us with Christ and strengthen our faith, build us up, and that you will encourage everyone who's come here. Bless each of us. Help us all to hear your word. And we're so thankful that the Lord Jesus has completed his time of suffering, has completed his earthly work and mission, and is now seated at your right hand where he is Lord in Christ and is powerful to save, yes, but also to sanctify. And we thank you that he is able to work through the members of his body this very night to give us a word from his heart. So, Lord, please speak then. And we really do need your help for me to speak well and for all of us to listen well. And we pray that you would be glorified in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, let's turn again to Galatians chapter 2. I say again because yesterday afternoon we started this little series and we read in Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to spend a fair bit of our time in this great chapter. Uh, last time we read the entire section uh, of Galatians 2.11 to 21. This time we're just going to hone in on that final paragraph of the chapter, Galatians 2, verses 17 to 21. Galatians 2, 17 to 21 says, but if, so here Peter, or sorry, Paul is speaking to Peter, and, uh, and Paul says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Is he a promoter of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I, I do think this is a better rendering than the King James, which says something like living by the faithfulness of the Son of God. It's not, I mean, that's a true statement as well, but I think the best interpretation of what Paul wrote in Greek here is that we live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. May the Lord bless his word to us. Well, just a little bit of review. Um, uh, we started by talking about that character invented by J.R.R. Tolkien named Wormtongue, who spends his life whispering soft little lies into the ears of the king. And he doesn't change the king from being the king positionally, but practically, he renders the king useless in his reign over the people. And this is what our enemy wants to do to us. Our enemy's name is Satan. And one of the great ways he works is, number one, by slander, but the other way is by deceiving. And, and so he tells lies, and he whispers secrets into our ears. Lies that don't stop us positionally from being Christians. We're still children of God positionally in Christ. But practically speaking, he renders us useless. He robs us of our joy. He, he steals our spiritual power um, because of these lies that, that he introduces to us. And uh, the lie we looked at yesterday was this. Lie number one, congratulations, Christian. You no longer need the gospel. And we worked through verses 11 to 21 to show the truth that actually the gospel is not just something that we begin with as Christians. It's not just something by which we become saved, but that the gospel is something that we then go on to live by. The gospel is not just an on-ramp 
to the Christian life. And the sooner we can get off of it, the better, because that's where the real thing begins. No, the gospel is the whole ramp. It's the whole thing. It's the whole way. It's not just the ABC. It's the A to Z of the Christian life. And the way we saw that was just by going through the chapter and we saw three things, even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. And even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. And then finally, we saw that even the best of Christians, a.k.a. Paul, even the best of Christians must live by faith in the gospel. Well, let's look at lie number two, and it's this. Only living by faith is only for some Christians. Living by faith is only per se missionaries. I remember I used to have this question, and actually I was asked it by a sister this past year. But I used to ask this question a lot myself too, a little one as a wee bit younger in the Christian faith. I used to ask, how do I live by faith? I understand how a missionary lives by faith, right? If they're way off in Zambia and they have no time to make a living and earn an income for themselves, how are they going to get the money they need to pay the bills and put electricity on and get food and so on? Where's the money going to come from? Well, we all say, well, they live by faith. That's where their funding comes from. They live by faith. They trust God to meet their material needs. And so I thought, well, here I am, you know, maybe I'm working at Southport or whatever. I have a salary. How do I live by faith? And Satan would love us all to think that living by faith is only for select Christians like missionaries. But you see what we've done when we thought that way, when we've asked the question that way? Do you, know, do you see what we've done? We have taken what it is to live by faith, and we have shrunk it down smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where living by faith is only about having our physical needs met. Living by faith gets reduced down and down and down, and so it's such a small little thing. It's, it's just this. It's just some Christians who don't live on a salary, they have to live by faith because they need God to pay the bills for them and put food on the table. And what I want us to do is see that that's a really shrunken view of living by faith. And that actually, living by faith is a very huge, but very just basic to everyday life thing that missionaries and non-missionaries, that little Christians and big Christians, that veteran believers and baby step Christians, all of us get to live by faith every day. And so let's look at our paragraph here. And um, we read verses 17 to 21, and maybe one thing you notice as we read is how often Paul says the word I. Just look at verse 20, for instance. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I, you see, I, 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 Paul keeps mentioning himself, but do you know why? It's because he's speaking as the representative Christian. Paul is speaking as a model Christian. He's, he's saying the kinds of things that he wants all of us in Fifth Ave tonight to learn to parrot. You know how a parent will say things, and next thing you know, little Johnny says the same things, right? And you say, where did he get that big word from? Well, he's parroting his mom, his dad. He heard that from his mom or dad. And Paul is speaking as the representative Christian, and he's saying these things, and he wants us to learn to say them too. But here's the thing. Uh, there was a series of, I don't know what it was, books or something. And I, I won't say the actual title because I don't want to offend anyone. But I'll just translate it into you know, appropriate language for this context. And it was this, kids say the strangest things, right? Kids say the strangest things. And I could give you some examples. My children aren't here tonight, so I'm free to uh, just, you know, open up the, the vault and uh, give all kinds of embarrassing, funny things that they have said. And I know you have them in your family too, but I won't. But kids say the strangest things, but I want to change that tonight based on what Paul does here in this paragraph and say, Christians say the strangest things. And as we go through these strange things that Christians say, we're going to all hopefully understand what it means to live by faith. But just, just four things that Paul says that are so strange, and he wants you and me to become very, very habituated at saying them too. 
where you just wake up in the morning and you say these things. Number one, you say, I died so that I could live. Number two, you say, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified. Number three, you say, Christ lives in me. And number four, you say, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just a little thought experiment. Imagine you took your children to skating lessons. And uh, after watching all the little kids fall down for the 100th time and someone picks them back up again, uh, the mom beside you leans over to you and says, by the way, did you know that I died so that I could live? What would you do? Uh, I think that's my kid crying. I'll go uh, check him out, you know? I, oh, what is this strange person saying this for? I died so that I could live. Don't, don't creep me out, right? Um, or, uh, uh, you know, you're at the gym and you're spotting for someone. And, and after benching, you know, 250 pounds, he, he says to you, did you, I want to share something with you, daddy. Maybe you didn't know this about me, but I, I have been crucified. <laughs> I have been crucified. You'd say, this guy can lift 250 pounds. I better get out of here, right? Uh, why is this? What is he on about? It, too many protein supplements or something, you know, performance enhancing things this guy's taking. What is he on about? Christians say the strangest things. Paul says these four things, and he wants us to learn to say them with him. And when we learn to say them with him, we will see what it means to live by faith. Number one, Paul says, and he wants you to say, he says, I died to live. Verse, look at verse 19. I died to the law so that I might live to God. And what Paul is doing here is he's dealing with this objection in verse 17 that came up every time, everywhere he preached the gospel. Paul would go into a place in verse 17 and he would tell them the truth of the gospel, which is the truth of verses 15 to 16, and we don't have time to go into it. But Paul would get up and say, listen up, everyone, you are all sinners, and none of you can be justified by doing works of the law. None of you, by your own obedience, by your own moral performance, can ever cancel out the record of wrongs that you have done and make yourself right with God. The only way you can be justified is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving his gift of righteousness as a free gift. And people would say, if that's true, all your little converts, Paul, have no reason not to devote the rest of their life to all the sin in the book, right? If the salvation is by grace, what's to stop everyone just to believe in Jesus and say, okay, now I've got a get out of hell free card and I can literally go into any sin I want. And so, and so when Paul preaches the gospel of grace, people respond to him in the language of the end of verse 17. Doesn't this make Jesus Christ the servant of sin? Doesn't this make Jesus Christ a promoter of sin? Paul, you've got to hang on to some law. I mean, tell the people to believe in Jesus, but make sure you keep at least a little bit of law in there so that no one goes off the rails morally. And there's always a teeny little bit of fear you can leverage with them and say, don't you keep doing that because... And, and, so, and so this is the objection. And Paul says, no, that's not true. Jesus Christ is not the promoter of sin. Paul says people who are saved by grace actually live more holy than people who think they have to live a good life in order to be saved. You see, he says in verse 18, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. He says, if I was to add the law back in, if I was to get up and modify my message and say, salvation is by faith in Christ plus a few nice little works of yours too. If Paul did that, he says, I would make myself to be a transgressor. I'd be going against the will of God. I would be 100% wrong in God's sight. You see, Paul would say, uh, adding the law into salvation does not curb sin. It causes us to sin. Look at verse 19. He says, the law was my biggest obstacle to living for God. An absolutely shocking statement in verse 19. The law was an obstacle that kept me back from even beginning to live for God. He says, I had to die to the law before I could even begin to live for God. 
There was no moral progress in Paul's life, he says, until somehow I got out of that relationship I was in with God's law. Do you imagine how shocking this was to Paul's Jewish audience? Who, in their mind, the law summed up everything you needed to know as to how to please God and get into his good books. And yet Paul comes out and says, I couldn't even start to live for God when I was in a relationship with the law. What is it about the law that is such an obstacle for you and me to actually begin living lives that please the Lord? What is it? It's not that there's anything wrong with the law. Paul makes that very clear in Romans 7. He says the law is perfect. Don't you dare say anything bad about the law. God made it and it is good. It is wonderful. It reveals the character of God. It's a wonderful gift from God to us. But there's something about it. Paul says that when you mix that perfect law with my sinful heart, it's a very bad marriage. So just maybe I'll go through three things quickly. about And this, this is going to feel like putting in time to fill up the 40 minutes. <laughs> but it isn't, okay? You invest with me in a few minutes of careful thinking, and we'll see if it doesn't pay dividends off in your life. Why is it that we need to get out of our relationship with the law before we can begin to live for him? Number one, because when we're trying to be saved by law-keeping, we can't love God. When we're trying to be saved by law, we cannot do anything out of love for God. Why is that? Because when we're trying to be saved by law-keeping, we're in a system where everything that's good that we do is meant to earn something back. It's meant to earn God's favor. Romans 8 puts it this way. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And to be in the flesh means you're in a relationship where it's all on your performance to get right with God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. A quick illustration to bring this home. Um, Charles Spurgeon is said to have given this illustration about this poor little farmer, and he's growing carrots. And, and he's got carrots popping out of the ground, and he looks at this one particular carrot, and it's huge. And he pulls it out of the ground, and he looks at it, and he brushes it off, and he says, here is a carrot fit for the king. And he brings this carrot into the king, and he says, uh, your royal highness, can I present this gift of a carrot to you? And the king takes the carrot from him and says, bless you, my loyal subject, you know. In return for this carrot, I give you uh, a, a field, you know, a beautiful field for your own. And the man says thank you and leaves, and he can't believe the generosity of the king. Well, one of the noblemen in the court is standing there, and he hears and sees all this take place. And he says, my, if that man got a field for a carrot, what would I get if I gave the king a horse? And so he goes to his, his stables and he picks a fine young horse and he next day brings it in before the king and he says, oh, your royal highness, I offer to you uh, the greatest horse from my stables. And the king says, thank you very much. You may go now. And I says, what? What are you? I was here yesterday and uh, this poor man gave you a carrot for crying out loud and you gave him a field. Now I give you a horse worth, you know, a million carrots and you're giving me absolutely nothing. And the king wisely says to the man, he says, that poor man, he gave the carrot to me, but you gave the horse to yourself, right? All of his giving was done simply to get something back from the king. And when you and I are in a relationship with the law where we're trying to get right with God based on the law, all of our good deeds all of our sacrifices, all of our volunteering, all of our going to church, all of our reaching into our pockets and popping something in the bag, all of it is nothing more than that nobleman giving a horse to the king in hopes that he would get something really, really amazing back. It's, it's just a, you're in a relationship with a vending machine. You're trying to press the right buttons and put in the right coins so that the blessing pops out from God. That's not a love really. You can't, you can't love God. When, and so Paul says, look, I had to get out of that relationship. I had to die so that I could live for God. But here's the second thing about the law that makes it impossible for us to actually please the Lord. Um, number two, it, we, we actually sin more when we're in a relationship with the law. We actually sin more. 
it actually provokes us to sin. Romans 7 verse 5 speaks of this. That, um, that oh dear me, I can't even quote it right now. Let me just see if I can get it for you very quickly. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, Romans 7 verse 5, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. It's like, well, let me, let me use an example. I'm going to pull out a, a law for all of you tonight, okay? And, and as soon as I show you this law, it is binding on every single person in this room, okay? So I hope you're all ready to look at my law because as soon as I show it, it is binding on all of you. You ready? Don't smile. Peter, you're very obedient tonight. But now you've lost it. And others of you are not being as obedient as Peter. I pulled out this law, and the first thing you wanted to do is smile. Now, this is a silly illustration. But in a sense, me showing you this commandment, showing you this law, provoked you to break it, in a sense, right? It's like I remember I was driving to Steinbeck to speak one Sunday morning, and I saw this uh, barn, you know, that was about to fall down and it had a sign, do not enter. And even though I was on the way to minister the word of God on a Sunday morning and had no desire ever before to enter that barn, when I saw the sign, I wanted to stop and go in. Even though that law was designed to protect me from having the thing fall down and end my life, it was a good law, right? But when I see the law, what does it do? It provokes me to sin. It makes me want to break it. Why? Because the law is bad? No but because of my sinful heart. If you read Romans 7, you find out Paul's experience. He says, I used to have this little sin called covetousness, and it was sleeping in the bottom of my heart. I never even noticed it. It was just having a nice little sleep. It was really, really small. And it was, he was just having a nice little nap in my heart. And then all of a sudden, the commandment came, don't covet. And that little wee creature called covetousness in my heart that was having a wonderful sleep, it suddenly grew a hundred times bigger and woke up and started crashing on the tank, you know, and, and saying, I want to covet, I want to covet, I want to covet. Why? Because the law provoked it, it aroused it, it woke it up and, and, and fed it so that Paul wanted to covet. And so, and so two things so far, the law makes it so we can't actually love God. The law makes our sin even worse. And number three, the law is powerless to change us. The law is powerless to change us. The law can spot our external wrong deeds, but it cannot change the heart that causes us to sin. I was reading a book by a man named J.D. Greer a year ago, and he talks about how he and his wife sat down and they did some analysis on J.D. Greer. And they noticed some patterns in his life. They noticed how he would um, lose his temper if he was losing an argument, get mad. They noticed how he'd get really anxious at certain points before he spoke in the church. And that he'd get really depressed at certain times after he spoke in the church if he didn't feel that the message had gone very well. And they also noticed that in general, his life was full of workaholism and he had very little margin for his wife and children. And they noticed a bunch of things like this. They even noticed that he was telling lies to cover stuff up. And they started to, to dig deeper and deeper. And they realized that underneath it all, in his heart, was this idolatrous desire to be right, to be esteemed, to be justified in the eyes of all people through his ministry. At the times he was anxious, he was worried that he might flop in front of everyone as he spoke. The times he was depressed was when he had flopped in front of everyone, and he couldn't handle that. And if he was losing an argument, he needed to uh, uh, get mad, you know, because he couldn't handle the fact that he would be wrong in front of someone else. You see, the law can come along and say, J.D. Greer, don't you get mad. The law can come along and say, don't you say bad words. Don't you tell lies. But it is powerless to deal with the idolatry in the heart 
that's causing J.D. Greer to do all those things, you see? And so Paul says, the law was my biggest obstacle for living for God. I had to die to it. Because when we're trying to be saved by keeping the law, we can't do a single thing that, to, to love God. It only provokes our sin and makes it worse. And number three, it is powerless to change the heart of sin underneath it all. But number two, Paul says, Paul says, and he wants us all to get used to saying this, he says, I died so that I could live for God. I died to the law so that I could live for God. But number two, he says, verse 20, I have been crucified. I have been crucified. You know, we, we hear these verses so often that we don't pause to just appreciate how strange and weird they are. Christians say the strangest things. Was there anyone in the history of the world before the Apostle Paul came along who would ever have occasion to say, I have been crucified, right? There were many people who had been crucified, but they never got to go around afterwards and tell people that they'd been crucified. And if you can't figure out why, probably need to get some more caffeine, right? But just to make sure we all understand, if you have been crucified, it means you've been crucified and you don't get to tell people anything, never mind that you have been crucified. But Paul, he says, I have been crucified. Turns out that this is what he means by, you know, I died to the law. This is how he died to the law. He says, the, I think what he's saying is that the way I died to the law and got out of that relationship with the law was that I have been crucified. How has he been crucified? He says, I have been crucified with Christ. With Christ. What we want to do Let's take a few minutes and try and understand what that means. I want us to understand what it means and then what it gives you. If you understand what this phrase means, how can it help you in your Christian life? I have been crucified with Christ uh, is Paul's way of saying, I participated in the crucifixion of Christ. What is it? Maybe that makes you nervous when I say that. What, what does this mean? What does this mean? You see, somehow, somehow Paul has found a way of being able to get the benefits of having been crucified without actually anyone ever pounding a nail through his hands. Somehow he's gotten in on the benefits of having been crucified without actually physically being crucified. How is it? He's been crucified with Christ. So what this is, is the truth of union with Christ. And my favorite illustration to use, and I think some of you have heard me use this illustration before, but bear with it again, is the story of David and Goliath, where one man representing the Israelites fought one man representing the Philistines, and David did all that heroic fighting as his people's representative. And it was David alone who had the courage to face the giant, and it was David alone who had the five smooth stones. It was David alone who slung that one stone with such skill and knocked the giant down, and it was David alone who grabbed the giant's sword and hacked off his head. David alone did it. But all the people he was representing got to share in the benefits of it as if they had done it without actually having done it themselves, because when David did those great heroic deeds, he did it as his people's representative. So that there's a way that an ancient Israelite could have said something like this, could have said, I have conquered the giant with David. I slew his, I cut off his head in David. No, I didn't do it. And I didn't have the courage. I was hiding behind a tent somewhere. I couldn't even look at the creature that was threatening us. But the thing is, when David did it, he did it for me. He did it as my representative. And even though I lack the courage and virtue and faith in God to do it myself, the fact that he did it means I get to share in all the benefits of it. I no longer have to wake up and hear Goliath taunting me anymore. He's gone. It's over. The benefits have been passed on to me. And it's the same with you and I as Christians. You and I lacked the moral virtue, the courage, the faith in God, the, the, the complete ability to die on that cross. 
The Lord Jesus did it alone. But when he did it, he did it as our representative. So that even though we can say the Lord Jesus alone was crucified, we can also say that if you've believed in him, you can say, I was crucified with him. And when he was buried, I was buried with him. And when he rose, I rose with him. And now he's seated in heaven. And Ephesians 2 says, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places because he did all those things as my representative. Now, what does this mean for you and me? What are the benefits of being crucified without actually physically being crucified? What's so great about being crucified? It's this. The law can never touch you again. Right? If your status is changed by Christ so that you have been crucified, it means that justice has been served regarding you. It means that the law can never come and crucify you again. Your crucifixion is over. And you can never be crucified again. David Gooding used to put it this way, that say uh, a man was caught murdering two people, and so the Romans took him and crucified him. And then they threw his body in the garbage dump. And then they found out two weeks later that actually it wasn't two people that that man killed. He'd actually killed five people. Well, they can't go to the garbage dump and pick his body up again and crucify it all over again, right? He's beyond the pale of the law. The law can't reach him. He's already been crucified. If someone said, I want to press fresh charges against that man, it turns out he killed five men, not just two. The law would say, I'm sorry, he's already been crucified. And so it is with you and me. Even if fresh charges were to come to light about you, even if what you thought your list of sin was only this long, but it turns out it's 60 pages longer. Even if now that you have been crucified, you go on and like me, sadly, commit fresh sin in your Christian life. The reality is, is that you get to live by faith and say with Paul, the strange things that Christians say, you get to say, I have already been crucified with Christ. And though I have just committed this sin, I cannot be punished for it. I'm beyond the reach of the law. My sentence has already been served on Christ and I was crucified with him. They can't pick up my body and stick it back on that cross. I'm beyond the reach of the law. In other words, we can quote the language of Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so... I have been crucified with Christ. The third strange thing that Christians say is, in the middle of the verse, I have been crucified with Christ, and then it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. The first aspect of union with Christ is that I am in Christ. But now we're dealing with the second aspect of union with Christ, which is this. Christ lives in me. Remember what we said about J.D. Greer and about how the law is powerless. I mean, it can bark at us when we do the wrong external thing, but it's powerless to change the heart that caused us to sin in the first place. Well, you see what the gospel does? The gospel says, by the way, your sentence has been served. You've already been crucified. No matter what you do, you cannot be punished. Again, there's no condemnation for you. But then it says, not only that, not only were you in Christ when he was crucified on that cross, but good news, believers, listen to this. It says, the gospel says, Christ lives in you. He has come to indwell your heart. There has been a radical takeover. Um, you've been crucified. The, the old you, the pre-conversion you, the, the you that's associated with all your sins and all your shame, all of that sin and shame in you has been crucified to the, in, in, to the cross in God's sight and is dead and is over and is done with. The old you is over. It's done. It's crucified. It's gone. And the Lord Jesus has come and has invaded your heart and he lives within you and he makes available to you all his resurrection power 
in your heart so that so that a man like J.D. Greer and a man like Mike Knox can come up here and find something in his heart that satisfies the need to be right all the time, right? I, I have a justification in Christ. That means I don't have to be justified by you, right? Um, I can handle it if I'm wrong now. Because I turn to Christ and I remember he lives in me. He empowers me to not lose my temper. There's a change in the heart. And so Christ lives in me. But number three, or sorry, yeah, just to, to finish off, this final strange thing that Christians say uh, comes at the end of the verse. So I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And now the final line of verse 20, and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's almost like it's almost like a little creed, isn't it? These are the things that we believe in. Paul says, This is how I live this new life of mine. I have been crucified with Christ. Jesus Christ has radically taken over my life and now lives within me. And now this new life I live in the flesh, this new life I live in my earthly days, in my physical body, it's a life marked by an ongoing reliance on this Son of God who indwells me. It's an ongoing reliance and believing afresh every day that he loved me and he gave himself for me. So what does it mean, brothers and sisters, for all Christians to live by faith? You see, it's, it's something so much more than this narrow thing as to, like, how will food get on my table? How will there be money to pay when my air conditioning breaks or when my vehicle fails? That's all wonderful parts of living by faith, but living by faith is so much more than that. It's something for every Christian. What is it? It's this. It means I no longer look to myself. I no longer look to my own performance. I no longer look to my own record of achievements. I no longer look to my own prayers, to my own gifts, to my own service, to my own record of success or failure. I no longer look to me, but I look to the Son of God, and I live by reliance on him. I believe I've been crucified with him. So even when I sin, I can't be punished. I believe that the risen Son of God lives inside me and gives me power to overcome temptation. And I never stop believing that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Can I, can I give you some made-up examples of what this looks like in real life? I'm saying they're made up, but maybe they're not made up. Hmm. Sue heads off to meet a friend for coffee so that she can share her faith with Sue. But it's been a crazy morning, and she drives out realizing that in all the hustle and bustle of it all, she never even stopped once to have a little quiet time with the Lord. Bible left unopened, not a single moment of eyes shut and prayers ascending to heaven. And as she drives to meet Sue, this realization sinks her heart, and she thinks, oh, God is not with me in this. I failed to give him the necessary quota this morning, and therefore he will be very stingy in his blessing to me. But then she begins to live by faith. And she remembers the truth, and she believes the truth of the gospel, that she's not in some law-based contractual relationship with God that works like that, where she puts in the right coins of prayer and Bible reading and out pops the blessing. No, she believes that the Lord loves her, that she's positionally accepted in Christ, and that, yes, it is important for her to pray for the Lord's help, but that she doesn't need to earn the Lord's favor by putting in morning prayers. And so she lives by faith by going on in confidence to meet with Sue, believing that her last-minute emergency prayer would still be meaningful and will be answered by the Lord, and he will give her the grace that she needs as she meets with Sue. Well, here's another example. Dylan. 
Dylan felt temptation so strong. It seemed like he couldn't say no. It felt like he literally couldn't say no. He had to go in and sin. But then he remembered, wait, that's not true. Even though it feels like I have to sin right now, the truth is that the risen, glorified Son of God indwells me right now. And all the power by which he came from death to life is available to me if I simply rely on him. And so he says, no, I don't. That's not the truth. I don't have to sin. By looking to Christ, by trusting in Christ this moment, I believe I can say no to sin. And guess what? He does. He says no to it. And as he says no to, experiences the rescuing power of Christ in his life. Well, Keisha, here's our final example. Keisha has had times of victory like that too, whereby relying on the risen son of God, she overcame that temptation, but not last night. Last night she forgot and failed. Her envy and her bitterness that her best friend got married and she still has that prayer unanswered got the better of her. And she tried to medicate her feelings by indulging in private sin. And now she feels awful. She's thinking, she's thinking about all the things she'll need to do to make it up to God so that he could begin to love her again. And then she says, no, that's living under the law. That's not the way my Christian life is meant to be. That's living as if I haven't died to the law and been crucified with Christ. So then Keisha consciously believes that with Christ she has been crucified and that all her sins are paid for. Even the shame of what she did the night before has all in God's sight been nailed to the cross and it's over and done with. Doesn't need to be brought up and, and morosely bathed in all over again. And so she consciously believes that Christ still loves her. She says, no, the Son of God loves me and gave himself for me. And she goes about her day by faith, believing that it's true. This is what it means, brothers and sisters, to live by faith. It's a posture of reliance on another. It is a daily hitting refresh on the URL of the gospel. A daily appropriation of Christ's grace that when I'm about to sin, a turning to him and saying, I believe, Lord, that your power is here. I can't feel it, but I believe it's there. And on that basis, I will seek to overcome this temptation. And then when you don't, because we won't always do that, we'll often give in, sadly. You don't wallow in shame. You bring it to the Lord and you confess it and you are sorry for it, but you, you refuse to believe that there is something you have to do to atone for it and make God to love you again. No, you say, even now, when I've done this for the 100,000th time, even now he loves me and gave himself for me. Even now I've been crucified with Christ. What I've just done doesn't change it. My punishment is over. I cannot be crucified again. And so, and so, brothers and sisters, in what area of your life, as we just close, in what area of your life tonight are you going to begin to live by faith? Yeah, there might be a bill that you can ask him to pay. That's living by faith, according to the Sermon on the Mount. But when we get into Paul's letters, we realize there's something far more basic to it than that. It's Daily, repeating this creed, if you will. I know we're not big on creeds, but here's a creed that's straight from the Bible that surely you could believe in. This is how I probably mostly start every day of my life. Lying in bed, feeling like he doesn't love me. Feeling like guilt separates me. Feeling shame feeling powerless. But we're not called to live our life by feelings. We're called to live our life by faith. So that living by faith is what every Christian does when she feels God doesn't love her and she feels helpless to overcome sin and she feels helpless to go back to him when she does sin. 
Living by faith means rolling out of bed in the morning and saying, I have been crucified with Christ. And he has come to live in me, whether I feel him or not. And he loves me, whether I feel it or not. I believe he loves me. Let's live by faith, Christian. Let's pray. Father, living by faith means we can speak to you in prayer, even when we feel like we can't, because we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this 50 minutes we've had here, and we pray that you will help us, Father, to live in all the good that you have for us in Christ. Lord, overcome the lies of the evil one, and let us enjoy the freedom that comes with the gospel. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is the one we've been crucified with. He's the one who indwells us. He's the one who loved us and loves us and has given himself for us. Oh, Father, bless as we continue to meet this week and help us to live it out starting now. In the Lord Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're uh, back tomorrow night and uh, Wednesday, Thursday is the final night. Each night looking at another lie and seeking to find help in God's words so that you and I know how to counter the lie. Um, so tomorrow is lie number three, which is, yeah, God might love you, but he doesn't really like you, right? Is that true? No, it is.